All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this moment. And I pray that your spirit be upon me in a mighty way, the way it has been on all the rest of this service, including our choir, which did such a beautiful job. And I just thank you again, Lord, and I'm not going to stop for what you do for our church. In spite of the fact we make mistakes, I make mistakes, we're trying, and we want to improve. So, Lord, would you speak through me and let us hear your voice clearly so that when we leave here, we will have a clear vision that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a distinct message and a distinct mission that is absolutely essential for the last days. So anoint me now, and thank you for hearing this prayer, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I went on the internet, and I looked at... I, I put down a list of revivals and reformations that have taken place across the world, actually. And when I did, I saw that, you know, things had happened in Europe. In the, of course, the Protestant Reformation is one of the greatest ones. And there were other minor ones in England or so forth, like because of the Wesleys. And, but I did find something on one website. They divided America into uh, four great awakenings. The first one was, it said, the American colonies, the first great awakening, was a wave of religion enthusiasm among Protestants that swept American colonies in 1730 and 1740. And then it said, and the, any, by the way, there was more information, I cut it. The U.S., the second great awakening, was 1800s to 1830s was the second great religious revival in the United States history, consistent of renewal, personal salvation experience, and revival meetings. Major uh, leaders included, and then they give their names. Then it said in North America, the third great awakening was in 1857. Onward, onwards in Canada and spread throughout the world, including America and Australia. And then it said the final great awakening was 1904. It had its roots in the holiness movement, which had developed in the late 19th century. And of course, that was also in Australia. I thought, how interesting. There was nothing that I could find in these websites on the the Great Advent Awakening that started in 1831. The Millerite Movement, in which the book of Daniel was expounded upon in a way that it had never been expounded on before. And thousands of people flocked to it. And we are told that Different individuals in Scandinavia, in South America, in Europe, even Joseph Wood in the woods, Wolf in the Middle East, were preaching that Jesus was coming sometime 1840 something. And I found nothing in those websites about religious awakenings that mentioned the Millerite movement of which the Seventh day Adventist Church came out of. Well, if you studied your history, you'll know that that great Advent awakening resulted in the great disappointment. And so today, just briefly, I want to show you the uniqueness of our message and why we would go to such great expense and also put ourselves at somewhat a disadvantage by putting this here on our sanctuary. In fact, I was thinking, 
You know, the choir had to stand up here. We had to bring mics here. You have to have printed song sheets because we can't put them up on the screen. We can't see it. We spent a lot of money. You know, Tanya and Brian came all the way here from Peoria, Illinois. They shipped it here. They set it up for us. Amen is right. I, I can't believe more of you didn't say amen. The Richland Center Church in Chillicothe, Illinois, gave us their sanctuaries for our meetings. And I especially want to thank Rod and Donna and Agnes Mushan, who started this 30 years ago. Agnes Mushan, I wish she could be here. That woman knows the sanctuary like very few people do. Why would we go to all of this? Well, I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to our first text found in our scripture reading today, Daniel 8, 14. In fact, Daniel 8, 13 and 14. So turn in your Bibles. Boys and girls, you better have your Bibles. Open them up, would you please? I want you to follow along. God has something special for the children. And by the way, God could not get any more graphic to children than to have given the Israelites this task to build this so that everybody could visually see who God was and what God did for us. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to this certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And then he said to me, Under 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, friends, I want to tell you there were a group of people that when the great disappointment took place, the vast majority left the movement. But there were a group of people that didn't. There were a group of people that thought, wait a minute, the Spirit of God moved in a mighty way. We looked at all these dates. We looked at there must be something else wrong. And they kept studying their Bible, and they discovered... What? What did they discover? The sanctuary. The earth wasn't the sanctuary, which they thought that Jesus was coming to cleanse the earth in 1843 first, then 1844. They discovered there was another cleansing that the Bible was talking about, and the sanctuary pinpoints it. And from this group, the Seventh-day Adventist Church arose out of the ashes of the Great Disappointment and now grew to a worldwide church. And it says in the Great Controversy, and look at your bulletin insert that I provided for you, the Scripture, Great Controversy 409, which above all others has been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration under 2,300 days and then the sanctuary would be cleansed. And I want you to know, folks, very few Christians understand that text. And I want you to know that more and more Adventists do not understand that text. Because in my view, and I'm being biased maybe, but I can't help it. We are not studying our Bibles the way we should. I want you to know when I met Agnes Mushan years ago, she studied and studied and studied and studied and built this over the years. Our church arose out of Bible studies. They would spend hours praying and studying together, sometimes all night long. We're facing the second coming of Jesus Christ. And are we doing that today? 
And so in the ashes of the great disappointment arose a church because they discovered the sanctuary. And what they discovered, A, under this first point, of the scripture above all others, that is both the foundation and central pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist church, is Daniel 8.14. We discovered there were two sanctuaries. Okay? There were two sanctuaries. Amen. And the one sanctuary was where? It was on earth. So take a look, if you would, at Exodus 25, verse 6. Let's do a couple texts really quick. Exodus 25, verse 6. And by the way, I expound on this. Our guides expound on this when we do the tour much more fully. But I want to get this message out so that you see that we go through all this trouble because this is who we are. This is what people need to know. This will answer our questions and other people's questions that they have about Jesus. In fact, the title is, Where is Jesus? What is he doing? And why hasn't he come? And you can ask a Christian that question, and they might say, well, he's in heaven. What is he doing? I'm not sure. And when is, why hasn't he come yet? Well, I don't know. But the sanctuary tells us all three. Somebody said, yap. But praise the Lord. God has gifted us with a blessing. It says here in 25, verse 8, it says, let, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that is shown you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Now take a look at verse 40. Take a look at verse 40. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Now let me take a brief time out here, and i got to be careful. I don't like to go over. You know, ask your Christian neighbor, what two things did God give Moses on Mount Sinai? And they'll all say what? First of all, the Ten Commandments. And then what will they say? Did God give Moses something else? <laughs> God gave Moses a vision of the sanctuary. In fact, look on your sheet here. The Hebrew word pattern means structure, a model, a resemblance, a figure, a form, a likeness, a pattern, a similitude. In the Hebrew, it implies that there was a pattern it was patterned after. You see, we discovered there were two sanctuaries. In fact, look at, let's go to the New Testament, Acts 7, 44. Move over there with me quickly, if you would, Acts 7, 44. Look what it says. I want you to turn there so that you can follow as I read it. Look at how specific it is. Here is Luke, uh, Luke writing, and notice what he said according to what Paul taught him. He said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that had been seen. See, that had been seen. On Mount Sinai, he didn't give him a blueprint. He gave him a vision. Because it had to be made according to the pattern. There were two sanctuaries, not one. And this is where we deviate from the others. In fact, within the Adventist church, you'll find individuals that deny this. And don't be shocked and horrified. Why? Because Satan hates this. And by the way, that means he's going to harass us. We're in for, for a little bit of challenging as we approach these meetings. Why? Because Satan 
hates this. This completely describes the character of Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament says the pattern. In fact, take a look at the Greek word. It's two posts. It means a die. You know what a die is, don't you? You make a die, like if you make a metal die, then you pour molten metal in them, then it forms the exact replica that you need for a part. It means die, it means a stamp, it means a shape, a resemblance, a figure, a form, a manner, a pattern, almost the exact words the Hebrew word uses, the Greek word. Well, where is this second sanctuary that we're talking about? Oh, if we had the time, Revelation 11... Revelation, I could talk about Daniel and Revelation till I die. We are such a blessed church, folks. And the book, Great Controversy, I'm telling you, the, these kids are going door to door. They're bringing these books. By the way, I'm going to encourage you. These, got, these, uh, these call porters have a magazine Great controversies. You can buy one from them. They'll sell you one. It, it's fantastic because it has big margins. I have one. It's all torn up because I wrote all over in it. I like it better than the little book. And, and here we find in Revelation 11.9, look what John tells us. It says, in vision, he said, then the temple of God was open in heaven. The what of God? The temple of God. And the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. Where is the second sanctuary? Where is the second sanctuary? It's in heaven. And by the way, I want you to check this out. For some reason on earth, somebody got into the ark that disappeared in Jeremiah's day, and they chiseled out the fourth commandment. But the box in heaven, no one has ever touched. It's still intact. When we teach the doctrine of the sanctuary, somebody is going to be moved on by the Holy Spirit to realize, wait a minute, if there's two sanctuaries, and this is a replica of the one in heaven, then the real Ten Commandments in the real box is up there. And that has never been touched because you cannot change the Ten Commandments. Not even the death of Calvary's cross. In fact, this is so simple. The great controversy taught me this. It's so simple because I puzzled over it. And it dawned on me. If Jesus' death did away with the law, he would not have to have died. Why? Because if it would have been done away with, it, if it can be done away with, it doesn't matter. But it's because it can't be done away with that Jesus had to die. Now, I need to take a time out. I'm going to go off here. Because even at a couple of our schools, I ran into opposition about our teachings, our schools. And some of them poo-poo this. Well, God doesn't need a sanctuary in heaven, I heard the intellectuals tell me. And I want you to hear this, to ponder it if you're one of those people. That temple is not for God. It's for the angels who do not understand what is going on. Yeah, you say, oh, they're perfect. They never sinned. They stayed sided with God. But their commander-in-chief under Jesus, Lucifer, went haywire, throw it out of heaven. In fact, we're told that until he crucified Jesus, they were still wondering if maybe he was right. That sanctuary is in heaven because the angels need it as the sanctuary was on earth because we needed it. And now we need it just as much as the Israelites because it tells us what's going on in heaven. 
Where is Jesus? What is he doing? And why hasn't he come? And so, number one, there are two sanctuaries. Number two, here's another quote from the great controversy. Yet important truths concerning the heavenly sanctuary and the great work that carried forward for man's redemption were taught by the earthly sanctuary and its services. So our pioneers not only discovered there were two sanctuaries, but what did they also discover? There are two services. Okay? And you come to the tour, we're going to explain that explicitly. Two services. The one took place every day, all day, all year long. In fact, let's read this. Take, go to Leviticus. First chapter, Leviticus, quickly, or even go slow. This is too important. Calm me down, Lord, please. Seriously, I, I, I'm very aware of your time, and I, I don't want to. But this is so important. Chapter 1, the burnt offering. Chapter 2, the grain offering. Chapter 3, the peace offering. Chapter 4, the sin offering. Chapter 5, the trespass offering. In other words, there's a series of offerings that the Israelites could bring to the sanctuary depending on their situation. And this happened every day and all day long. But on the seventh month, Tishri, and on the 10th day of that month, something very special happened that never happened any other time of the year. And that is when the sanctuary was cleared and the high priest took off his beautiful garments and he had only his white underwear, his white robe, and his white bonnet. And then he sacrificed a bull ox and a ram for forgiveness of his sins and the congregation, and then two goats were brought to the sanctuary. And they threw lots for the goats, and the one that became the Lord's goat was slain. And the one that became the scapegoat stayed alive. And the high priest entered the most holy place where no one is allowed to ever go except once a year to present the blood of that special goat offering to wipe the record of sin off of this sanctuary and off the people who, were, who came to the sanctuary and knelt around it, all the way around it, all of them and prayed and repented while the high priest did this work. And when he left that sanctuary, and he brought that blood out, by the way, he then anointed, he sprinkled seven times before the ark. And then he came back into the golden altar, and he sprinkled seven times. And then he went out to the altar of burnt offering, and on the horns he anointed the horns. And the Bible in, Revel in, in Leviticus clearly says when he did that, he cleansed the record of sin, the impurity and the pollution off of the sanctuary. And then he laid his hands on the other goat, and the other goat disappeared in the wilderness never to be seen again. Oh boy, I wish I had time to read Leviticus 16 and 23. If you haven't read it recently, do it again. Read about the Day of Atonement. It's the day that points to the fact that our high priest Jesus will finally put an end to all of this. Amen. He's waiting for his people to get ready so he can finalize that in heaven but by looking at the sanctuary and discovering two services, the Seventh-day Adventist Church realized that there is a day of judgment 
a time of judgment. And the sanctuary will be cleansed. Number three, page 417, Great Controversy. But the most important question remained to be answered. What was the cleansing of the sanctuary? What one word could we use to describe the cleansing of the sanctuary? Yeah, I think those two words are interchangeable. Atonement, judgment. All right, take a look at Leviticus, Le, Leviticus 23. I want, to, I want to highlight this one for sure. Leviticus 23. And we'll start with verse uh, 26. You got it? Everybody, come on. Say amen. amen. You got to make sure that you inform me you're still awake. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month shall the day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. That, by the way, the high priest had already done with the bullocks and the ram. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who does not afflict his soul on that very same day shall be cut off from the people. And any person who does not work on that same day, that person will be destroyed from among the people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation and all your dwelling. There it is. We are living in the antitypical day of atonement. We should be afflicting our souls. By the way, If you read any commentary, you'll find afflicting your soul has to do with repentance and fasting. Fasting. I want to tell you something. Fasting also means the health message. Mm -hmm. That we would restrict our diet according to God's specification, not because we wanted to, but because he's telling us that during this period of time, we are to afflict our souls. And Seventh-day Adventists, among all other people, know this. And yet it's a struggle. Well, it's okay for it to be a struggle, but if you're giving in to it, it's just like the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. 10% is his cut of the action for blessing you. And you can give me every reason not to pay it but you are robbing God. And Seventh-day Adventists, above all other people, should be 100% faithful tithe payers. Because we see graphically what Jesus did for us through the sanctuary, that we brought a helpless, innocent, but perfect sacrifice because we did something wrong, and we confessed our sin on that sacrifice, and then we were given a knife, and we cut the neck, and that poor animal laid down and went like this till the blood was captured and ran out into the pan of the priest, and we went free. What a God we serve. And by the way, afflict your soul. What's your motivation? He afflicted his soul. He came down here and fasted like nobody else ever did. We will never be asked to give up what he gave up in order to come in flesh. Wow, what a church. What a message. What a mission. And why is it frightening and difficult? The world doesn't want it. But that can't stop us. And Satan doesn't want it either. And then Daniel... Uh, I guess I'll cut it short. Daniel 9 I, Daniel nine tells us about the same judgment. 
In fact, in Daniel 9, uh, Daniel 7, excuse me, 9 and 10 and 13 and 14, it says the books were, the, uh, the seats were set and the books were open. And I happened to notice that it says the seats were set means the court was set and the books were open for judgment. And then finally, we go to Revelation 14, 6. And what does it tell us? Revelation 14, 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him because judgment already started. Not it's coming, it started. And what a privilege we have that God gave us to be Seventh-day Adventists in the last days of Earth's history, to give a message to a world that's dying and that doesn't want to hear it. Isn't that exciting? And so here's why we brought this beautiful sanctuary. We didn't bring it here. We begged for it. And it was given to us. Notice the quote I have, Great Controversy 519, uh, 419 and 420. As in the typical service, there was a work of atonement at the close of the year. So before Christ, so, notice the transition, so before Christ's work for the redemption of man is completed, there is a work of atonement for the removal of sin from the sanctuary. A work of investigating, investigation, a work of judgment. And so, my friends, that's why this is here. To help visualize the beautiful message that this church has been given. And so, what do I want you to do? I want you to pray three times a day. Didn't they, uh, Paul, um, David said, evening, morning, and at noon, I will pray and lift up my voice. And in those three times a day, I'm pleading with you to do this. Pray for Jeff, uh, Cruz, Damare Banks, Mary Neary, Pastor Julio, and Sammy Camacho. Number B, pray that the advertisements get to the right people. C, pray that Satan's plans and purposes are defeated. And then finally, I want you to pray for the Richland Center, for Tanya, for Brian, for Donna, and Rod, and Agnes, for not saying, no, this is ours, and we're not going to give to you. It could be wrecked or something. They said, yeah. Let's see how we can do that. And so please, three times a day, bring this paper home. Lift it up before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to pray now. And by the way, if you, you go to work and you pray in the morning, feel really good, go to work, and you forgot noon and you got home and maybe you were in a rush and the kids, whatever, food, I don't know, you went to bed and you went, oh, I didn't pray. Then pray right then. Let's unleash the power of God. And let's see what he will do even greater for this church than he's already done. And so I invite you to stand with me as you would. And let's sing our closing hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor to Thee, Redeemer King.
I'm going to pray now the benediction. And during the benediction, I want to give each one of you a chance to make a decision. Make a decision that you're going to follow through. Say it to God while I'm praying. Yes, Lord, I'm going to pray three times a day. Or for somebody here, it may be, yes, Lord, I will go to so-and-so's house and invite them to these meetings. Yes, Lord, I will make an effort to go to the tour so I can learn more about you, your character, your nature, and how much you love me. So I'm going to call you to a decision while we're praying. Don't slip out of your chair. By the way, if the Spirit tells you to run up here, run up here. But I'm asking you in your head to make a decision and then commit it to God. Father in heaven, you are so incredible. I wish I was the Lord, the Lord God. I wish I was merciful and I was gracious and I was long-suffering and I was abundant in goodness and truth. And even though I struggle with some of those, you still love me and you still answer my prayers. And so I want to represent you more fitly. I want to be more faithful to you because you never failed to be faithful to me. And now, Father, move on every single heart and mind here, including me. What specific decision needs to be made. In fact, there may be somebody, Lord, I just thought of this, who is not baptized and they know they should be, but they've been holding back. And if that comes to their mind, that's your spirit saying, this is what I want you to do. And so, Father, what is it? And now, Father, for those that know or heard or are pondering, I want them to respond to you in kind. Yes, Lord, I'll do it, but I'm scared. Oh, you'll send me the Holy Spirit to strengthen me? Okay, that's a deal. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can't do this alone. So bless this congregation, Father, that if nothing else, they are sure that you love them. And then bring us back to worship you next Sabbath and give you the praise and honor you deserve. And thank you for hearing this prayer and for speaking to each one of us. Because we prayed in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.